Please welcome to the stage Benedict Cumberbatch and Ann Lunas, Chief Marketing Officer at Adobe. <laughs> all right, everybody take all your photos now. One mass photo. Come on. There they go. I'll bomb it for you. <laughs> <laughs> all you see is people taking photos. Yeah. And all you can see is, is the photo of the people <laughs> and you, that are taking And you photos. wonder if anyone's really enjoying the live this experience. This is true. This is very true. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this sort of evolving in the sort of short space that I've kind of expanded in terms of fame or exposure. And it's kind of, uh, it's bizarre. It's shifted from the point where... You know, people, you'd, you'd come out and say hello and people would wave and now it's just literally sort of a, a phone salute. And they're like, hello Ben, how are you? You know. So, uh, it's weird. So, what's life been like since the Oscars? Um, uh, pretty normal. I mean, I've got, you know, gone back to work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm nesting for my family, uh, my imminent family, and uh, just living a London life, basically. It, it, it's, it's, yeah, of course, the moment is extraordinary and I think if depending on where you're at in your career, it can give you a great kind of surge forward. But um, I've got a production company. I've got things that are already sort of lined up for, for myself and for that company. So work-wise, it's felt, it's been wonderful to be acknowledged in that way, but it doesn't feel that it's shifted the whole kind of axis or perspective of my world, to be honest. Um, hmm. That's not to say it wasn't a wonderful moment. And the best, best, best moment was being nominated and ringing my parents, who were both actors, mm. and saying, your only son has been nominated for an Oscar. That was... That was amazing, unforgettable. So uh, about a month ago, we had a conference just like this in the United States, and um, we had the With, pleasure of having yeah. Michael Keaton oh, as great. our guest, and I interviewed him, and I asked him whether he thought he should have won, and he immediately said yes. Yeah, and he <laughs> so we all um, have won. maybe I'll ask you: Do you think you should have won? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because it's not about winning. Do you think Michael winning. Keaton should have won? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him. And Eddie. You know. So why don't and you, Steve Brown. Why don't you, you think know, you should have won? Because, you know, you can't go into it thinking that I'm like, no, because I think, you're I'm British sure Michael and you're gracious. was having some fun with it, you know what I mean? And that's what you have to do. It's, the whole thing is a celebration. But if you take it to a, to a com competitive level down the way, when I heard the feedback of Eddie's performance in Toronto, I thought, well, he's going to get the Oscar. I knew then, and that was months before. And stupidly, I didn't bet on it. <laughs> the part of me was thinking, that's a really odd thing to do, to bet on that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I, he's a dear friend of mine, and that's an extraordinary piece of work. And, it is. you know, a unique character to play is, I know very well, having played a, a smaller screen version and a smaller period of time version of Stephen's story on, on the BBC a few yeah. years ago. So weirdly connected through both the actor and the subject to that whole thing which was odd to begin with but then actually rather wonderful because it meant I got to see a lot of them and celebrate with them and you, you can't feel hard done by when you're doing the kind of work that I've been asked to do and it gets the recognition that it's been getting I, there's, there's, no, there's no fallback, there's no need to complain, I'm very 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 sincerely content. And I'm sure so. you'll be nominated again and you'll probably oh, win the next time. Well, we'll see, but yeah, yeah. And then I'll get really competitive. And then you'll get... <laughs> and then it's, yeah. So, how, how does this feel yeah. to be, like, so famous? <laughs> it's freaky. It feels like, yeah, it feels like I'm just... <laughs> it's life-size, it's 100% Belgian chocolate. It feels like a health hazard looking at that. That's how it feels. <laughs> you don't be eating all of me at once. That's crazy. Um... Gosh, the How does it feel to be so famous? Uh, look, I don't know. I mean, I'd say that it's, it's... The thing that's odd about it, I think, is when you walk into... This is, funnily enough... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, at least it's, they put it's the a grand down. volume. This is a conversation. This is normal. This is what you want to have with people that you meet in life at certain points. You know, you want to be able to talk honestly and openly about what you feel and what you're doing and who you are and who they are. That's the only weird thing is it's a very one-way process. But as far as this end of what I receive being well-known or famous, whatever you want to call it, this is sort of normal. What's abnormal, what's always difficult and I'm still adjusting to is the idea of 
being recognized before knowing anybody, anything about the person recognizing me, adjusting to being the observed rather than the observer, being the product rather than the buyer, being yeah. the viewed rather than the viewer. And that's, st that's still ongoing. You know, I, I want to live as much of a normal life, whatever that means in my exhausted circumstances, as I can as an audience, as a member of um, my community, my society, whatever level that is, family, bigger, local neighborhoods, you know, town, country, nationality, you know, however wide that bracket gets. And, you know, my work does a lot of that. It's a huge amount of communication and belonging in that, which if I could just stand beside my work behind it, wherever, just not, you know, not having to talk about it more than just do it, um, I'd be very happy. But we don't live in that world. Um, so there's this sort of mass exposure of communication. Things can go incredibly wrong, can go incredibly right, can just be fun, can be hard work, can be overexposed, can be... Uh, underdeveloped, uh, whatever it is, you know, there are varying levels of that which are interesting. Interesting to engage like, but slightly embarrassing when it gets to the point of being on the front cover of Time and people going, you know, you're one of the most influential people in the world. You think, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to, to harness that. Maybe the good people at this conference can tell me how to, how to use that. I mean, <laughs> I'm careful of my brand, whatever that is, in terms of being an artist. I make very specific choices about where, selfish often, about what I want to do next to surprise myself as well as my audience. and what I think would be good to do next or show that I could do next, but it's not really about, because of what I've achieved, it's not about getting a bigger market, it's not about getting a bigger audience, it's about doing things with that audience that, that are interesting, that are unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting out of the, the, the cast type, uh, typecasting of being a kind of officer class hero or being someone who only does uh, seemingly difficult intellectual I was going to ask uh, you about that, actually. And, you know, moving. So that, that's part of it. But, you, but come back to your question, you know, fame, it, that's the oddest thing. Within work, within the promotion of the work, sometimes it gets very weird. Within the work, it's fine. As in, I don't mind having an audience that is going to judge me, love me, hate me, feel indifferent, whatever. I don't then really always relish um, the idea of being accessible beyond your work. And it's a really nuanced thing to say that, because you hear actors complaining about it, you think, oh, come on. You've got this life, you've got this work space, which is all about needing an audience. Now you're saying no, but I don't know, think of it in terms of other professions like doctors, like people who give lectures at, at, you know, to these fine people in these circumstances. They don't want you tweeting what you're doing in your kitchen. <laughs> you know, they, don't, they don't want you to be you know, gossiping about whether or not you were holding hands with your girlfriend or whatever, or who your girlfriend or wife is. And you know, it, private and public, there is a sort of separation which sort of could lead us neatly into talking about social media a bit as well. But, you yeah, know, we'll I, talk about that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's the, <laughs> I don't do it. Well, I talk about it. I could talk about it. But we'll talk about it a yeah. little later. That was a long answer, sorry. That's it's a, early in the morning. No. I hope you've all had coffee. So yeah. There's a lot to enjoy about fame, but I think it's common sense to most people. I'm just saying what people would probably feel if they were in my position. Yeah. And what lots of other people who are in my position feel. You know, it's pretty obvious stuff, but... Um, and it's, look, that's what, in fact, that, when you get to my level of, of, of whatever, that's what you're paid for. It's not the job. The job is still something, don't tell any producers this, but I'm very happy to do for free. I get such a kick out of it, you know. <laughs> I genuinely love my job. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> brain. Um, and Charles Babbage, I think his name was, who began computing around the time of the Industrial Revolution with patterning for car on cards for programming hardware, the, the looms, these incredible machines churning out first time these incredible patterns based on software being fed into hardware and coming out programming a computer which resulted in data as a stunning carpet or, or, or tapestry. And so he advanced that with the idea of computable numbers, this idea of a universal machine was the real, as far as I can understand it, the real um, evolution. I feel really nervous now talking to all of you about this. This is... Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's like okay. Nobody here knows job. anything about data. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, you're all. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, I found you know, from that. Oh God, I can't remember where I was. That's really made me very self-conscious. Saying that I'm self-conscious. Don't worry about it. Well, 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 I was talking about Alan Turing. Yeah, I was talking you were about, talking about. Did I know about him? That was yeah. The did you know Thank about you. him? Christ. Um, so, yeah. Obviously you not. Talk, you want to talk about being famous again? No. <laughs> No, definitely done that. Um, no, I, 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 and I knew a little bit about him from being a student at Manchester. So I'd, I'd seen that bench, the famous bench, where there's a commemorative statue to him. 
I mean, I didn't is he know more famous he in was England? A gay icon as much as he is. Um, again, no. Well, more famous in England what, than in the world. Than he general? is in the U.S. I, I would, no. I, you'd have to Clearly ask Time not. Magazine that question. Yeah. I think they, they got their finger on the pulse of who matters in the world. I don't think he ever made um, it to the top 100 <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. As far as being a gay icon, he was a man who quietly admitted his his nature in a time of intolerance and didn't sort of loudly martyr himself, which is again another reason why as an actor I was very happy to be loud about his story, not playing him hopefully, but in talking about him, um, because he never would have done this, he would have found it all utterly, um, not repugnant, not necessarily in a kind of judgmental way, he just would have found it really difficult apart from anything else, I mean his stammer was really marked, much yes. more so than we could afford to make it in the film, but it's there. and. Uh, was a massive component as, as to who he was and, and how he and why he did what he did. If you're a you know a young child in a near Victorian age and you can't speak fluently and yeah, yeah you can't make the normal social bonds, so how do you go about um, justifying your existence and finding an identity? I think it makes complete sense that you turn inwards and become this sort of rather extraordinary, exceptional, um, and, and different entity thinker person, soul, brain, but it doesn't mean that he was necessarily on the spectrum necessarily, there are co correlatives with mm -hmm. certain behavioral patterns of autism I suppose in particular, but um, it sort of simplifies I think the kind of context of his nurture which was very, very, yeah, very much the science and, 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 and nature behind his nature. Um, so I was so where was I with that? Yeah, so I knew, I knew little bits about him, but yeah, I, I, one of the driving passions was to bring, to bring the him. injustice of what happened to him to light the incredible war he had, which was responsible for potentially saving millions of lives by bringing an early cessation to the violence by cracking the German Enigma code. Um, and being this, this, this father, this godfather, this evolutionary stepping stone in computer science. So you mentioned earlier you, you tend to play these kind of big brains, mm. Stephen Hawking, yeah. Turing, Sherlock, yeah. I'll ask about Sherlock in a minute. So yeah. you inject kind of some glamour, some intrigue, so is there a pattern? You said there's not a pattern, but do you I think, pick I these think with those roles, they're just the sort of, well they're the tipping points, aren't they? They're most sort of extreme and interesting kind of... Uh, on the paper and in, in the flesh, it's like, how do you, how would this work in the real world? What, what situations do you put these people in? Which I think the writers have a lot of fun with, with our version of Sherlock. And it's, it's a great thing to explore. You have more breadth and color and dynamic, I suppose. And I think, you know, audiences are increasingly being treated as the intelligent human beings they are and not being patronized with oversimplification and, you know, just linear storylines and, and dull characters that, that you know you're allowed to now express the kind of fizz and pop of great ideas and and fast speaking fast moving brains and intellects and that's that's really exciting and my job I guess as an actor as it is always is to be a storyteller so I've got to bridge the gap between those characters exceptionalness and what makes them universal and human so there is some level of empathy or understanding or um, oh yeah no I feel like that I mean it's it's rare to feel like Sherlock I'd imagine but <laughs> you know, it's, it, I think it's, it, you've got to build these people as something that is recognizable and achievable as well to make them real heroes in many ways. He says, as the actor who's about to play Doctor Strange, that's going to be tricky because <laughs> he works on an astral plane which most of us don't. You can don't play know. anyone very stupid. Yes, I'd love that. No, but that's the point. It's not, yeah, because I am. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I talk a lot, but it would be a cakewalk Dumb for me. Dumb and Dumber 3. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Less lines, the better, and yeah, just completely. And who knows, there might be something I've already done that's, that's of, of that ilk. But um, the point is, uh, it, it's about variety, but those characters really sort of, they are highlights in the literal sense of that word. You know, they kind of do stand out and uh, for obvious reasons like I've described and while the challenge is sometimes to rein them in and bring them down to earth it's also just it's so much fun to play those characters but at the same time it's a lot of fun to play Patrick Watts in Start of a Ten, Little Charles in August of Sage County, the um, slave owning William Ford in um, Twelve Years a Slave who is crafty I think you know, people say, oh yeah, you play the good slave owner. There is no such fucking thing <laughs> as a good slave owner. And especially with him, I think he's morally the most corrupt. You know, yeah. he's, he's preaching the word of God and, and practicing very little of it and selling someone he knows to be better and therefore probably a free man because that was a practice at the time, a really 
even so you play another villains. level of performing capacity. Uh, no, I play heroes as too. I play questionable here. I mean, my point no, is, I try to keep. No, you would play the, villains. Yeah, yes. yeah. Khan, Smaug, Sher Khan. Can't get away from the Khan Khan. <laughs> Um, who else have I played? Uh, well, you know, Sherlock, yeah, he goes to a pretty dark side. It's not... As any, if anyone hasn't seen the last episode, close your ears now. But yeah, he shoots someone. That's not winning. That's committing yeah. murder. Well, but Sorry. Sherlock is but, not really a villain. No, Sherlock is, like, so popular. Ten million people in the UK watch Sherlock. There's not one show Legally. in the US that <laughs> ten million people... Literally, there's not one show, I think, except maybe the Super Bowl and possibly the Oscars that 10 million people watch in the United States, wow. where we have over 300 million people. So wow. this show is hot. Rung up by two amazing writers who are huge fanboys of the original, who have a very protective um, kind of uh, parental care of the legacy of Conan Doyle's original and have the most exotic, spiraling, challenging imaginations that can just take it's a leap forwards into the 21st century. And you then, you know, I, 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 that's how I first heard about it. I first heard about the idea of modernizing Sherlock, and I was like, whoa, don't, don't, don't mend it if it ain't broke. And then I heard who was involved in supposedly mending something that weren't broke. And uh, they're, they're brilliant, brilliant writers. And I knew Mark from his work in League of Gentlemen. I knew Stephen for a long, long time before he'd written a series called Coupling, which was really big here. And um, my parent, actually my mum had, had been at Sarah Alexander's mum in it. So, and your parents are in, are they they in the play final my parents. episode? Yeah, they are, yeah, in the first and the, and the third of the last series. And um, so, you know, I, I knew about this much as an audience would going, pff, pff, modern Sherlock, I don't think I'd give that a miss, you know. Um, and yet, you know, knowing who was involved, I thought this is going to be a cracking read at least. I read it and completely fell in love with him and their take on it. I thought this would be a wonderful thing. And I knew then because of the nature of the role and also how well they'd done it, that it could potentially sort of spill into a sort of limelight moment as far as what I'd done until then had been, you know, tried to sort of build a, a career. I wouldn't say a working actor, but just, you know, just going from job to job in a sense. and building up a, a retinue of work and a profile, but n nothing that would go like a sort of you know, 9 o'clock Sunday night yeah. BBC drama can do. You know, I mean, witness Poldark and, and everything that's happening now to, to him. And you know, he's, he's, he's a friend and he's a wonderful guy. And it's like, I know exactly what he's going through. It's crazy. Not that I'm as good looking or whatever, but it's, it's an amazing, weird, screwy, bizarre moment. And when it happened to us, you know, we, we were confident we were doing a good thing. But um, when it, the actual night it aired, and this could possibly get us into social media, which is obviously a huge part of Sherlock, we, for the first time I was sat around um, with Stephen at his house and, and Mark, and they were on their computers looking at the Twitter feed and going, oh, it's trending. And I thought, trending? <laughs> what is this word, trending? Is it the clothes? I, mean, I had no idea what that meant. You know, I, didn't, I didn't understand it was a volume of excitement and kind of participation. And this is the immediate thing of having a live audience through social media. So it was terrifying and wonderful all in one go. You know, you usually go to the papers the next day and go, did they shit on it? Or did they think it was all right? Or think it was, oh, what a horrible croaky laugh that was, sorry. <laughs> or did they, or did, they, did they think, well, yeah, probably worth tuning in for next week, see how it goes. And immediately you had this volume of fandom going, yeah, you know, mainly just, this is crazy good, which was wonderful. But it meant that I was sort of stepping out into the night, getting my train home or bus or whatever it was, and just expecting, you know, journalists to sort of be abseiling out of helicopters and, you know, flash bulbs to sort of jump out of bushes. I thought, you know, and it was, it sort of happened virtually, my fame in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. I did the work, it was in the can, it went on telly, and then it went, what? like that. Um, so you're not a big fan of social media. You don't, don't have an far. active Twitter account. I think we have I'm not, maybe I'm not, some... No, I think it's important to state the difference here. I'm not, it's not that I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> it's that well, you're not a fan of having your own I don't social need media to be account. A fan of it. But you apparently is, love it photo bombing. Without me, you see. <laughs> yeah, but that wasn't me thinking, mm, what can I do as far as social media goes in this particular moment? <laughs> but that you was... have a huge, I mean, you have a huge Twitter account yeah. um, that is not operated by you. I have a Twitter account. Well, it, uh, people are do. <laughs> This happens a lot. The, the group this, that this shall remain a nameless I, has a Twitter account on your behalf, and it. they they write quite a lot about you. So what do they? they what do they do? write? Let's see a bit. They're the they're which the, is what the one on the right hand corner. The, yeah, 
the Benedict's on a plane. Bees. The cumber bees. Benedict's brushing his teeth. Well, this is the thing that happens. So, you know, the weird thing about fame now is you walk out into any social context that's not utterly in your control, which is basically life, and um, everyone is a walking publisher. So you get somebody who know, you know is just sort of walking by, and there are lots of tactics. I just want to show you a few of the ones you might have already used, but use them again, uh, by all means, if you, if you don't already. This is the, the, walking, the walking shot. This is like, I'm not really taking a photograph of you. You're, you're me. Yeah, so, yeah, no, it's great. Um, I just, um, yeah, just, um, <laughs> there's that. Then there's, um, then there's the other one, which is sort of like, oh, I'm just doing some texting. Ugh, I just think I need to text whilst looking at the horizon. Um, and then there's the one which is just like, oh, just having a little stretch, just waving my arm around. <laughs> and then what you mustn't do, what you really mustn't do here, when you've done that, is do that and just sort of think you've got away with it. You have a screen on your phone and you haven't closed the app. You can see a picture of me going. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, so that, and the thing is, that then all gets fed back into social media because someone puts it on Flickr or Facebook or, or Twitter and then it just goes, and someone out there is going, oh, great, I can paste together a piece of shit for the Daily Mail with this, and that happens a lot. <laughs> or it goes on the internet to, you know, just some website I've never heard of under my name, you know, with everything from my blood type to um, what colour socks I'm wearing today. Red yeah. and black, in case you're far away. <laughs> you know, we'll be in driverless cars soon, so we won't even know where we're going. We won't need to know. We'll be able to be on our tablet <laughs> looking at something else, and then we just arrived. It'll be a sort of slower version of teletransportation. We just don't know. We're kind of not reassembled, but we're selled, moving, and arrive, and then we're out. And, you know, I just worry about the trade of bumper stickers, for example. I mean, what's going to happen to that industry? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> troubling, troubling times for people who've oh got things God. like Baby I'm Bored on, on the back of their car. Um, so I'm not a fan. I just, I'm intrigued by it. I, personally, as a user, I haven't engaged with it. And that is to do with time. As any one of my questions being, oh, your questions being answered by me has proven, I would be shit at it. Um, how can you, I, I can't, you know, and fans get a great kick out of me trying to condense anything I ever say into 140 characters. It's just impossible. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not good at it. Um. So this conference is about using data to measure the effectiveness of your brand, okay? Yep. So, and, you know, the success of your <laughs> I'm brand. I'm sitting here saying, I don't bother. Yeah. That's terrible. I get other people so to do it for me. For That's you, awful. Really so how do you measure... <laughs> for behind. you, how do you measure your own success? Um, by how many Weetabix I eat in the morning. I don't, honestly, I don't, I don't, this is the weird thing somebody actually told me, which I think does make relevance to, to me. I mean, you get here, nominated for a lot of awards, you have it, people standing in line to see you. So, but in terms of what you're talking about, I, somebody sent me a text or some, somehow got the information to me in my sort of hermetically sealed way of, of look, you are, you, you've come out on some poll as being one of the most highly valued commodities in the digital media. And... I, you know, that's, to me it is, it's much more, like you said, it is a more human thing. That doesn't mean anything to me. And I don't know what to do about being up there with the Pope. I don't know, I, I know only what I can do in my life for my work, which is great. And if it means that I take an audience to stories that I want to tell or worlds that I want to play, that's fantastic. It doesn't always happen, actually, but that's great. When you go, wow, I really, you know, people told me the show was big here. It's huge, you know, it's, it's really strange. Um, and so then, the work. It, so it is, it's a human thing for me and more than anything else. And because I'm not on social media, I'm not monitoring it. And, and just to go back to that no, very No, but you don't have, it has nothing to do with social media. It's, no, no, but I'd like know, to go back to that if that's all right. But I'm just talking about the idea yeah. of like how I, you know, not, not view it, but, um, oh, damn it. I forgot my train of thought. That's all right. Let me ask you another question. Yeah, Let me Even you, the incredibly likable you, couldn't make Julian Assange likable. So let, let me show you guys a clip. Oh, maybe I failed. It's critical. Julian Assange is not a likable man. Even Benedict Cumberbatch could not make him likable. He's uncumberbatchable. <laughs> that was supposed to be physically impossible. <laughs> so um, that's John Oliver, who's English, but apparently more popular in the United States than in England, but just in case more you don't known, know who more it is. Known. <laughs> more I known. I think he's very popular here as well, but he's more so known. So why was, why was that your most challenging role? Uncumberbatchable. I love being turned into a Isn't that the best? So much fun. Uncumberbatchable. Or is that an adjective? Who knows? Discuss. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> 
fucking hell, poor Julian Assange. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't, this is a, this is a bear trap if ever there was one. I mean, what do I say? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, even otters can be made to be confused and, What? <laughs> I've stumped you. A little, yeah, <laughs> uh, because, um, I hate the idea that I can cutify anything. I like presenting warts and all for a start. I don't, I, I don't shy away from complexity. Um, he's being flippant, he's being funny, and it is very funny. Um, but if there is a serious point to be made, um, and particularly about Julian, is that, you know, it, it, it was a very personal take on an incredibly personalized political moment in history, really. So yeah, fuck whether I make him likable or not, who cares, you know? He's, he's got his fans where they matter, and uh, you know, I mean, in a serious note, it does not matter. It's not, it's not, it's not a you know, popularity contest. No? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, you don't go into this thinking, right, well, I've got to make everyone like me, and just to go back, this is my point, social media, you know, there are moments when the narrative of perception, as far as brand or anything you want to call it, just what people think or understand or know about me is utterly out of my control. So a newspaper has the legal right to write an article that can be a cut and paste job, literally a cut and paste job from all the worst moments or slightly awkward or misinterpreted or potential negative thing about me and blam, there's a profile and you walk away going, what? What a fucking asshole. I want to see him skewered on a stick and paddle batted through Soho naked whilst being, you know, all of his bank account drained and thrown at any problem in the world and then his family being humiliated for the rest of their lives. I mean, it, you know, it creates huge amounts of hate or justified hate about that tall poppy syndrome of build him up to take him down, which you know, I knew was always going to be a part of whatever stepping into Sherlock land might, might, might behold. For all its goodness, there's a weirdness to that, you know. But you just... You, you take a breath and go, A, I can't control this, B, I can't make everyone like me, and you'd be a madman to try. Um, and you wouldn't be any good at your job, I don't think, or be true to yourself, or what really matters in life, if you did. And I make no apology for that. And um, that's where the lure of social media has often raised its head, and I've gone, oh, I want to get involved in this one, I really want to punch this dickhead back. <laughs> I really want to get out there and put the record straight. I am not spoon-fed by, I'm not going to go into them all now, I'm so tempted to, the myths out there about me, but in, in a way that's the Trojan horse, that's what people want, because then the cycle can exactly. continue. Um, so and let me that, ask that you goes that. for a lot of things, so again, that's another sort of measure of success, is how much you can sort of step away from success. So yeah. I heard you want to play David Bowie, and yeah. I would love to see you play David Bowie. Do we have a picture of what that might look like? Oh, do we? So... <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So there are rumors that you might actually get a chance to play David Bowie. Um, so one, can you confirm that rumor? And two, why David Bowie? No comment. No comment. Sorry. That's lame. Like I said, I'm not. That is I'm, very I'm, I'm, lame. I don't give a fuck about being liked by everyone. I'm so disappointed. No <laughs> yeah, a lot of words. A lot of words. Data. Pardon? Data. Oh, data. 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 Uh, well, you said data. Data. Which I've never data. Hello. <laughs> I have a data stick. Data. <laughs> data. Oh, I like data much better. So I should say, I'll say goodbye to you today. Data. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> data, um, information, I guess. Yeah. Cumberbatch. Me. Me. Yeah. Okay, give him a hand. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was great fun. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.